and welcome to the Johnson Controls Blue Water Webinar for April. Each monthly webinar is an interactive digital experience for water utilities to learn more about new technologies, software, services, and best practices in a vendor neutral format. The Blue Water Webinar is brought to you by the Water Infrastructure Technology Team of Johnson Controls. I am Craig Hanna, and I am blessed to serve as the engineering manager of this wonderful team. I have been designing projects that reduce both real and apparent water loss, that increase staff efficiency, and that decrease operational and maintenance expenditures for water utilities for the past 20 years. And joining me today are two of my outstanding teammates, Audrey Noel and Jonathan Gunn. Audrey leads our team from sunny Southern California. And Audrey, would you now tell us more about how you serve the water industry? Absolutely, thanks, Craig. I'm Audrey Noel, and I have the privilege of serving as the business development leader for the water infrastructure technology team here at Johnson Controls. I have six years of industry specific experience and have spent, spent decades in the world of operations. And we spread the team out coast to coast to cover the nation. So let me introduce Jonathan, who manages our water market from the not so sunny state of New York. Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, good morning. Thank you, Audrey. Yeah, I'm Jonathan Gum. I'm, I'm a market manager with our water infrastructure team here at Johnson Controls. I have about 12 years in the industry. And uh, like Craig, I've, I've developed a number of projects, uh, meters, AMR, AMI, leak detection, uh, all those sorts of good things. And also like Craig, I, I, I sit in a number of positions with the American Water Works Association, uh, including currently as the vice chair of the Customer Meter and Practices Committee. And I co-author a number of manuals and publications as well. So uh, appreciate everyone being here with us this morning. And um, whether you've been here with us on previous webinars or whether it's your first one, uh, things may look a little different this month. So uh, I did want to take a, a, a quick minute just to go through what you're seeing on your screen. Um, you know, no surprise here, something that hasn't changed, and you should see some orange bubbles popping up on your screen here as I talk. Uh, you have the slide deck. So that's where a majority of the action is going to happen here. That's where you'll see uh, the slides as we go through the webinar. Uh, we do have a few different poll questions as we progress as well. So you'll see those poll questions uh, in that window, and you'll be able to respond uh, in that window. To the left, you'll see the media player. So this is where you're currently seeing my video feed as I speak to you. You'll see the video feed of our other presenters today as well. Below that is uh, related content. So this is where we have some additional downloadable content that you can go and um, get and read at your leisure. It's some supplemental information to some of the topics that we're gonna cover here today, and uh, including an article from our very own Craig Hanna, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, if you've been with us on previous webinars, uh, this window might look a little new to you. This is the attendee chat function. So uh, in previous months, uh, you've been able to ask us questions, which by the way, just to the ready attendee chat is the Q&A. So uh, uh, you can still do that. May submit questions to us as we're going through if you have anything you want clarified or um, you know, send us a joke, I mean, whatever you want to do, but um, that is directed to the presenters. But um, again, new this month is an attendee chat. So uh, you can chat with your fellow uh, webinar attendees as well and exchange ideas or, or ask questions to the group as well. To the right of the slide deck, we have the email box. So um, if something that we say today uh, really uh, just grabs you and you want to talk to us more about it, you know, send us an email or better yet, um, you know, if you feel it something that deserves a little more of a, a conversational dialogue, we have a book a meeting function uh, right below that as well. So you can set up a meeting with us and we're happy to talk to you and see how we can assist you. And last but not least, along the bottom of your screen here, you should see the, uh, the various icons. So <clears throat> all of the windows that I just covered, you can move around, you can resize, you can really make uh, this experience your own. But in moving those around, if you happen to hit that little X on there and make that window go away, uh, all hope is not lost. You can just go on the icon bar at the bottom and uh, you know click the appropriate icon of whatever it is you lost. There are some additional ones as well. So if you're here and you'd like to earn CEU credit, you are eligible to earn CEU credit for this webinar. So please use that button and uh, send us your name and we'll, we'll get you a certificate as quick as we can. There's also a uh, reactions button. So as we're going through the webinar, if you wanna give us a, a clap or thumbs down or whatever it is you wanna do, uh, there, are, there is a reactions uh, feature there as well that is, that is new this month. And then last but not least, uh, the take a survey function. I, th I think we ask this every month. Um, we're always looking to uh, make these webinars better and, and really hit on the things that you would like to talk about. So uh, please take a survey at the end. Just let us know how we did so we can uh, continue to improve the series. So with all that being said, Craig, uh, do you want to walk us through the agenda for this morning? 
Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. We have what we believe is an exciting, informative, and hopefully fun webinar for you today. We think that you will be amazed at some of the photographs that we will show you. Safety is always a primary concern for us, and we'll be starting our webinar, as we always do, with a safety talk. We've asked our friend Aaron Horbovitz of the M.E. Simpson Company to help us with safety around large water meters. Following that, our team will conclude our in-depth two-part discussion about best practices for large water meter management. And then our friends Maurice Blackwell, Joe DeVito, and Travis Smith from Badger Meter will join us for an interactive discussion about their product line, their roadmap for future releases, and the state of the water industry as we see it today. Now I'd like to introduce our good friend Aaron Horbovitz with the ME Simpson Company. Aaron is both a hydraulics engineer and a certified project manager who specializes in municipal water distribution and flow measurement. He currently serves as the chair of the AWWA Customer Metering Practices Committee, and he is a subject matter expert in large water meters. Aaron, we're so glad that you could join us today. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, like Craig said, I've, I've been doing this job quite a long time. Uh, when he asked me to, to come and speak at the webinar, specifically on safety, I got to thinking about uh, the various things that I've seen, the various uh, you know situations I've encountered, and I, and I had to think about you know which story I wanted to tell, basically. So what I'd like to highlight in terms of safety is how it, it really is a team effort. Had a situation a number of years back I don't go out in the field much anymore, but I got pushed into the field to go do some testing to fill in. And uh, I go down into this vault, and it's, a, and it's an enormous vault. It's 40 feet deep. Now, of course, you know, we use uh, air, air monitoring and, and measurement to make sure that the air is clean before we go in. But uh, it's just this enormous vault. And you get inside, and it's almost like a, like a building. This is a, for a very large meter in uh, the city of Atlanta. I get down there and I'm supposed to access part of the pipe so that we can insert equipment and take flow measurements. The problem is, is that the point that I need to access is on the other side of the vault and there's no way to get to it. And so I asked the guy I'm working with, I say, how did you guys get over there, you know, in years past? And he says, uh, well, they just walked across the pipe. This is an 84 inch pipe and it's a 15 to 20 foot drop off of either side. And it's, it's like wet. I'm like, I mean, it literally looks like, like a slip hazard under, under the best of conditions. And the idea of falling 15 or 20 feet off of this pipe down in a vault where who knows how long it would take to get extracted. I told him, I said, I, I, don't, I don't think I can do this. And he says, I'll come down and do it. You know, okay. So he comes down, he looks at it, he goes, this is crazy. He goes, I'm not doing that. And I said, well, how did your guys do it before? He said, they just did it. That was the point I wanted to bring up. From the top side of that vault, it didn't look like much of a hazard. When you get down in the vault, you could see that it really was a hazard. And the guys he was working with, I guess, didn't know better. They didn't know to, to say, hey, this is dangerous. I shouldn't do it. They just did it, which, which was the wrong move. So we told, this, we told the utility, we were able to figure something out, uh, a temporary solution. We told them they needed to build a catwalk so we had access. <clears throat> that was the point I wanted to drive home is that safety is a team effort and it's not just, you might know what is the most safe thing, but maybe the person you're with doesn't. So communication, making sure everybody's on the same page and uh, working so that everybody gets to go home. And that's all I have. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, of all the stories you've told me over the years, Aaron, I don't know if I've even heard that one. So I uh, <laughs> appreciate you. <clears throat> excuse me, sharing that with us this morning. And um, you're absolutely right. Safety is a team effort. And um, we definitely appreciate you, you sharing your thoughts with us this morning here. Thank you, um, Jonathan. Something else that uh, we wanted to talk about briefly here uh, before we begin our discussion on, on large, best, large meter management uh, was an incident that happened in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, where a Birmingham Waterworks utility truck was struck by a gunfire on the night of Tuesday, February 15th, while an employee was driving a meter route. So thankfully, uh, the employee was not hurt, and the latest news indicates that the police are still investigating this incident. But um, 
you know, similar to the vault and just being aware of your surroundings uh, that, that Aaron was talking about a minute ago. Um, you know, always be aware of your surroundings when you're in the pit or, or not in the pit. Um, you know, especially when it's when it's dark outside. Um, I know, thankfully, for those uh, here in the northern hemisphere, days are getting a little bit longer, thankfully. But, um, but yeah, just always be aware uh, where, wherever you are. All right, so as we said a number of times in the last few months, uh, our team is very passionate about water meters. Um, you know, this, this the water infrastructure team here at Johnson Controls, you know, we do a lot of different things in the water industry, but uh, I think, call it nostalgia or whatever, but meters I think are still probably one of our favorite things. And really this is primarily because your water meters are your cash registers. You probably heard me say that a few times for those of you who have joined us previously. And for, one, for many water utilities, the large water meters specifically have the ability to generate 30% or more of total revenue for your utility, despite only accounting for a small quantity of meters in the distribution system. And as we said last month, we even know of one water utility in Oklahoma that generates 75% of their total revenue from just two large water meters. As such, it pays to learn all that you can about large water meter selection, installation, operation, maintenance, and testing for these meters. And as Craig mentioned a moment ago, today's focus will be on the large uh, water meter operation and maintenance. Uh, we, we covered some of the installation and uh, selection uh, things at, at last month. And this will conclude our series uh, on best practices for large meter management. For the sake of a quick refresh, or uh, for those folks in, who may need a quick refresh on what a large meter is, uh, a large meter is defined as any meter three inches and larger or if you have an inch and a half or two inch turbine or compound type meter, that would also be considered a large meter. So you may wonder why it's important for us to discuss large water meter operations. And the answer is quite simple, because sometimes the red rags just don't work, not as they should at least. The leak shown in this image is part of the fire service compound meter assembly. It's part of the meter and is technically the responsibility of the utility to fix since the utility owns the meter in this situation. However, at one point or another, this leak was discovered and the utility worker decided that a rag was the best tool to fix that leak in the moment. Unfortunately for the customer being served by this meter, the leak is located downstream of the bypass meter. So this means that the water passing through the bypass meter going through the leak is being registered as consumption. As such, the customer is paying the retail volumetric rate for water that is lost through this leak due to an improper repair by the utility at some point. We encourage you to train your staff so that when they see problems such as this in the field, they will know how to make the appropriate repairs as soon as possible and to also notify the billing department so that the customer is not billed for the water that is lost from that leak. If your utility has either a mobile AMR or a fixed network AMI system, uh, it's still important that you assign a crew to conduct an annual survey of every large meter in your distribution system. Based on our experience, we can all but assure you that uh, the assigned crew will probably find a few surprises in their inspection, and it will make it well worth the time and effort involved. And this photo is, uh, quite frankly, a, a frightening example of what may be found. So in the winter of 2017, we were developing a, a water meter and AMI system projects for a small utility in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. We came across a hotel that was being served by a four inch compound meter that was located in the basement of the building. Uh, I took one look at this meter, shot a few photographs as quick as I could, showed the situation to uh, my escort from the water utility that was taking us around to the meters, and then left the basement as quickly as humanly possible. My escort from the city promptly contacted the property manager who was fortunately on site at the time. And what you're seeing here in this photo is uh, every fastener from the 10 inch manifold at the point of service entry to the outlet flange on the four inch compound meter and to the riser of the six inch fire service line had corroded to the point of failure. There was nothing but friction holding this entire setting together. If there had been a pressure surge or spike in the area, both the entire water meter setting and the fire suppression system most likely would have been blown apart, leaving either a 10 inch opening or a four and a six inch opening to flood the hotel basement, which by the way, also happened to contain all of the electrical switch gear for the hotel. Being that it was in upper Michigan, the streets outside the hotel were, were covered in several inches of ice and snow at the time. So I asked my utility escort on, on a good day, on a good day, how long would it take you to close that valve and shut water off to the hotel? He replied that on a good day, it would take at least an hour. 
So if you do the quick math, uh, you look at you know some potential flow, flow rates through those size lines and, and a one hour delay minimum before the water is shut off. Uh, you know, at least 60,000 gallons of water and more likely over 180,000 gallons of water would probably have flooded into the hotel basement before the water could have been shut off. Uh, Craig Hanna actually wrote an article about this experience that I talked about, I touched on just a, a minute ago there, uh, and it was published in the AWWA Opflow magazine. And you can download a copy of that article in that supplemental content module uh, if you'd like to read more about it. So we apologize for the quality of this photo, but in our defense, uh, it was a snowstorm and uh, we we're standing at the rim of a meter vault and uh, temperature was in low teens, wind chill was below zero. Uh, definitely, you know, not the most pleasant day to be out surveying meters, although it's probably good that uh, I, I was out in this one and not Craig or Audrey because, you know, I'm in the Northeast and they live in the nice, warm, sunny parts of the country. So, so if you look at the red circle in this photo, um, you know, it may be a little difficult to make out here, but uh, you may be surprised, just as I was, to see a C-clamp that was being used to hold the strainer and the concentric reducer together. C-clamps are known to become loose over time due to vibrations on the pipe, and I was amazed that this clamp was still holding. Needless to say, this is not a best practice, and we strongly recommend that you use only stainless steel nuts and bolts that have been treated with an anti-galling compound and stainless steel flat washers for all large water meter settings. Doing so will protect the meter setting from failure caused by fastener corrosion, and it will make meter maintenance and replacement much easier once the meter has reached the end of its useful life. As a quick reminder, it's always a good idea uh, to clean and flush your strainers as well during your annual large meter inspection. Strainers are a very inexpensive insurance policy to make sure that your meter is protected. Cleaning the strainer and ensuring that it's operating properly can save you from an, un from an untimely replacement of large meter. So here are a couple photographs from a, a large meter vault that is about to collapse in on itself. Uh, frankly, I was stunned when I first saw these photographs, uh, and not even because the vault was, was caving in, but uh, because unlike the photographer, I would never have gotten into that vault. Uh, just, just a little bit too dangerous for my taste. When the day comes that those cinder block walls finally buckle and fall, there's a very high probability that both the meter setting and the bypass lines will be crushed. Even if the utility is able to find a street valve nearby and quickly shut down the service, this will be a very expensive emergency repair and will likely require some heavy equipment to clear out the rubble before an assessment on the water line can even be made. One also has to wonder how long the apartment complex, which happened to be served by this meter, would be without water while those repairs are being made. An annual large water meter inspection would have caught this problem early when the walls could have been shored up properly. Here's another interesting example for you. And uh, when we showed this photo to the director of public works at this utility, uh, his response was simply, quote, well, that's a problem 30 years in the making. So if you look at the top of this photo here, and I'll, I'll put a couple orange markers up here, you'll see a, a tree in very close proximity to that meter vault. Because no one bothered to cut down the tree when it was a sapling and keep the area around the vault clear, the sapling grew into a very strong tree. And over time, that tree decided that the meter vault was inconveniently located next to it. As such, the tree has pushed the meter vault wall inward to the point where the wall is actually inhibiting the operation of the isolation valve for the meter. This entire meter setting and the vault will need to be replaced, and the water line serving the vault will also likely need to be relocated because as the tree continues to grow, the roots will most likely crush the water line. So before we uh, continue on here, I do have a quick question for the group. Um, single answer here. So uh, who is responsible for making the necessary repairs to a large meter setting in your utility? Is it, uh, are you as the utility responsible? Is the account holder that's being served responsible? Uh, maybe you don't have large meters, that's okay. Uh, uh, maybe there's some ambiguity there, but uh, if you wouldn't mind, just take a, a brief minute here. I'll give it maybe 10 seconds or so and just let us know uh, when you come across uh, an issue with a large meter, just who is responsible for that setting. There we go. Some submissions coming in here. 10%, I know we can do better than that. All right, give it five seconds. There we go. Three, two, one, all right. Okay, more often that's the responsibility of the utility. Okay, all right, we're not applicable. Interesting, all right. We'll appreciate the feedback. It, it 
it lines up with what we see. So it's it's it's, it's always interesting to see from a, a random poll out there. So appreciate the responses. So this uh, this example here, just continuing on, uh, this example doesn't involve a large tree, uh, but it does serve as another example of why it's important to keep the area around a meter pit clear. So years ago, we were installing new meters on a fixed network AMI system for one of our customers. And at one location specifically, we installed the new meter, we installed the AMI system endpoint, we tested the functionality of the setting to make sure everything was working properly, and then we moved on to the next account. You know, pretty Pretty standard operating procedure. However, just a few days later, this endpoint suddenly stopped transmitting information through the AMI network. So we sent a crew back to the residents to troubleshoot the endpoint, and we discovered that the resident thought that the new shiny lid for their new shiny meter box was in fact ugly. So to fix the issue, the resident purchased one of those whiskey barrels that you can buy at a hardware store, you know, been cut in half. Uh, so they bought one of those, they set it on top of their meter box, filled it with potting soil, and then planted some flowers in it. And it, it looked great, it really did. Uh, it looked very nice, but unfortunately, it did create a number of issues for the utility. Not only did the whiskey barrel flower box make radio frequency communication challenging, but it also denied anyone access to the water meter, the AMI system endpoint, and to the critically important, important curb stop. Uh, so not an ideal situation to say the least. And if that customer would have had an issue where they needed their water shut off, it would have just taken that much longer uh, to access that valve and, and get their service shut off. This photo serves as a, a gentle reminder that test ports are not service takeoffs. So in this example, um, the property owner decided to install an irrigation system. And instead of paying the water utility or a contractor or, or whoever to come out and install a new tap on the main service line, install a new water meter setting, and most importantly, install a backflow prevention device, this property owner used the test port on their existing water meter as a source for their irrigation system. While the property owner may have thought that they were saving money by using the test port as a water source, uh, in an ironic twist, they were actually costing themselves more money. They were losing money uh, because they were paying for sewer charges on water that was being used for irrigation. And this was a utility where if you had a dedicated irrigation meter, you didn't have to pay sewer charges. So they were also risking public health by not having a backflow prevention device on that irrigation line uh, should some event happen there. This meter setting has uh, a few things that need improvement. Um, as we mentioned in our, our webinar last month, uh, never install a backflow prevention assembly upstream of a water meter. Uh, that backflow may have an adverse effect on the flow profile passing through the meter and may cause it to uh, not be accurate. And if there is a backflow event, the backflow won't protect the meter from the pressure shock as the backflow slams shut to stop the backflow of water. Additionally, someone has installed a two-inch tap on the T-fitting located upstream of the plate strainer, meaning that all the water passing through this tap is unmetered and therefore is on non-revenue water for the utility. We encourage you to train your meter technicians to look for unmetered taps during their annual large meter inspections in order to reduce the non-revenue water in your system. If you've been with us for the last couple of webinars, this uh, slide probably looks familiar to you at this point. Uh, you know, I've said this in past webinars. I said it earlier just a few moments ago, and I'll say it again now. Strainers are just a, a, such a great investment <laughs> when it comes to protecting your meters and thus your utilities revenue stream. The debris shown on this slide uh, came from inside a large turbine meter that we disassembled and the setting obviously did not have a strainer. The meter had stopped registering any usage and we found that a section from an iron pipe had become lodged between the impeller and the stator and the debris was preventing the impeller from rotating at all. Thankfully, we were, uh, we were pretty lucky with this meter since uh, you know we, we removed the debris and we tested it and it was found to be uh, accurate. However, there are a number of cases uh, where this sort of luck does not hold true and the entire meter needs to be replaced because it's just too damaged. This example serves as a reminder to regularly review your large water meter accounts and dispatch a meter technician to the site whenever your billable usage is plus or minus 10% of the historical usage for that reading cycle. And, and remember as well to make sure you're accounting for seasonality there, um, you know, winter to winter, summer to summer, et cetera. We strongly recommend that you investigate any no usage uh, on active accounts for large water meter services as quickly as possible so that you're not uh, causing undue loss of non-revenue water. 
So before I hand the reins over to Audrey, I did have one more question for the group here. And this one is uh, a multiple choice. So you can click uh, as many or as few uh, as you want in this question. But um, you know, what actions are taken if you discover metering tamper meter tampering in your utility? Um, you know, do you do you automatically levy a fine? Do you call law enforcement? Um, do you just correct it and, and move on and just keep note of it? Um, you know, or do you do something else? And if you do do something else, uh, uh, you know, just uh, for our own just curiosity, uh, you know, either submit something in the Q and A module or or use that email function and send us an email as well. We're always kind of interested to see uh, what folks do uh, in their utilities when they encounter some sort of tampering. So. And the million dollar question, Craig, is what happens if it's the police department that's stealing the water? That's a very, very good question. I think we've encountered that before, haven't we? We have. We have just once, thankfully, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll give this one a, a few more seconds because I know you can you can do uh, it's not just a one choice here, but yeah. Seeing three well, people. You remember... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if you remember our first webinar, we told the story about the the uh, individual that had a tap on the water, gas, electric, and was running a still and a casino gaming operation all at one convenient location. Yeah, one stop shop. Yeah, <laughs> Mini Vegas. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm seeing some more come in here. Six, seven. All right, you can give it about five seconds. Three two one all right all right kind of yeah. an interesting spread here all right interesting so some are fine so and, and who knows some of these are probably uh maybe more than one as well so um interesting yeah, and if you will, uh, if you have other measures that you take, uh, let us know what they are in the Q&A module. We, we'd, we'd like to learn how your utility handles uh, this this issue. Absolutely. Yeah, or an email. So. All right. Well, I appreciate the responses there. So, uh, Audrey, I'm going to hand it over to you. Do you want to walk us through some additional operations and maintenance steps? Sure thing, Jonathan. <clears throat> well, every water utility must be vigilant in the review in the review of billable usage. If there's a noticeable decrease in usage, dispatch a meter technician to learn why. In this example, the bypass valve on the six inch meter setting at a hospital has been open and the setting was the largest water user in the city. We estimate that this theft of service event was costing the utility over $135,000 in unbilled water and sewer revenue per year. If you discover an open bypass line valve, Document your findings. Some utilities may require that law enforcement become involved. At a minimum, we recommend that you cut in a water meter for the bypass line, install an AMR, AMI system endpoint, and create a new account in the billing system to prevent this from happening again. Here's another example of an open bypass valve on a large water meter setting. I found this one at a high school one cold January morning. Remember that water always takes the path of least resistance and a two inch PVC pipe can flow well over 160 gallons per minute. Dual body compound meters merit special attention for your operations because it's quite easy to close the bypass meter isolation valves. In this example that I found at a manufacturing plant in Southern California, no flow below eight and a half gallons per minute can be registered by the water meter. Fire service meters also merit special attention because it's quite easy to close the bypass meter isolation valves. I was working with a utility on the Texas Gulf Coast that used the fire service compound meters at condominiums, and we found seven or eight of these fire service meters with the bypass meter isolation valves closed. In this condition, this water meter cannot register any usage at flow rates of less than 45 gallons per minute. This could have been a very nice large meter installation if only there was an outlet valve, a test port, and someone to reinstall the register back onto this three inch turbine meter. This illustrates why you need to promptly investigate those no usage on active account reports. And whoever did this clearly understands how a compound meter works. They removed wow. only the bypass meter register from this three inch compound meter body which means that no usage below about 12 gallons per minute is being registered. 
Now let's discuss some best practices for maintaining those all important large water meters. For mobile AMR systems, send a technician to troubleshoot any endpoints that simply will not be read at the end of every billing cycle. For fixed network AMI systems, send a technician to troubleshoot any endpoints that have not been read after 72 hours. Otherwise, the quantity of endpoints that don't read will soon become very overwhelming and your reading system that's so critical to your revenue will steadily degrade. And many of us remember the classic Wendy's commercial from the mid 1980s in which workers at a mythical fast food chain restaurant are asked what parts of a chicken are processed into nuggets. And they simply say, parts is parts with a big smile. Well, when it comes to water meters, however, parts is not parts. It's very important that you only use the correct part for any water meter repairs. And here's why. This one slide should explain why you need to use the correct parts when repairing a water meter. Someone replaced the original register on this two inch Neptune HP horizontal turbine meter with a register for a two inch Neptune T10 mutating disc positive displacement water meter. After all, aren't all two inch meters from Neptune the same? Well, unfortunately they are not. And there's a very big difference in register gear ratios between a two inch Neptune HPT meter and a two inch Neptune T10 displacement meter. Installing a register for the two inch Neptune T10 displacement meter on this two inch Neptune HP turbine meter caused the meter to under register by a usage factor of about 24. And similarly, we have a four inch Elster T3000 horizontal turbine meter with a four inch Badger meter register. Unfortunately, there was no test port on this setting and we couldn't test the accuracy of this contraption to determine how inaccurate it was. When we showed these photos to Badger meter, they were dumbfounded. No one knew that the register shroud from a Badger meter product could even be mounted on an Elster water meter body. And our last example of poor maintenance practices that may also have an impact on public health and safety is seen in this six inch census fireline fire service meter. At some point, the census two inch SR positive displacement bypass meter that was originally installed on this fire service meter was replaced with a two inch Elster C3000 dual body compound meter. The Elster C3000 dual body compound meter is listed as meeting the AWWA C702 standard for a compound meter, but the manufacturer does not state that the meter also meets the AWWA C703 standard for fire service. Moreover, the Elster C3000 dual body compound meter is neither UL listed nor FM approved. If there's a fire event at the property, and if a portion of the loss can be assigned to not having the correct type of meter installed, the utility potentially could find itself liable for a portion of the loss. And we're often asked how frequently large water meters should be tested. If any large meter has a sudden unexplained decrease in billable usage, it should be tested immediately. Otherwise, we recommend annual testing for any meter that generates $15,000 or more in revenue. Meters that generate between 7,500 and 15,000 in revenue per year should be tested mm, every other year. Meters that generate less than 7,500 in revenue per year should be tested every third year. And if you follow this recommendation, you should maintain your revenue streams. And one last point, water meters are not self-healing. If a water meter tests inaccurately, its accuracy will only decrease as time goes by. Those inaccurate water meters either need to be repaired and retested or replaced promptly. So let's hear from all of you out there. How often do you test your large water meters? Is it never? Annually? Do you test frequently based on the revenue generated or only when there's a problem? Give this one a couple seconds so we can hear from all of you guys out there. I really hope there aren't a lot of nevers being checked. <laughs> <laughs>
And if there are, please send me an email. <laughs> Great. Let's talk. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Seeing some responses here. There's three. There we go. Let's just say there's a lot more about. And, and you're anonymous. You, it, it's anonymous, so you can be honest. Yeah, we won't even know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we turned up with annually. That's a good one. Frequently. That's great. Not applicable. At least nobody checked the never box. That makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So, well, that, that pretty much wraps up our team discussion on best practices for large water meter maintenance, but we'd like to hear from you. Please use the Q&A module on your console to ask us any questions that you guys might have. Yep. Seeing one here, Craig. Um, <clears throat> looks like you may have answered it in the in the Q&A, but just for the benefit of folks who may not see it, um, there's a question about other dissimilar metal corrosion issues associated with using stainless steel nuts bolts connecting non-stainless materials. Yes, and um, it's been our experience that any corrosion from uh, any bimetallic corrosion is, is probably negligible. Uh, I've never seen a, a very advanced case anyway. Yep, yeah, neither have I. We'll put it to you this way. That, that meter we showed you earlier, which uh, was being held together by friction, I don't think that would have happened, <laughs> even on a long timeline. <laughs> yeah. Here's yeah. one. Uh, uh, someone what, asked what if we ever found. Oh, go ahead. Yep. Go ahead, Jonathan. I was gonna say. I was gonna say. Um, here's one. What What procedures do you recommend following whenever you discover a theft of service event? Greg, you want to take that one? Yeah, I'd be glad to, Jonathan. Yeah, the for me the important thing is is documentation. The first thing I do is, is start taking pictures of uh, of what I found, and hopefully I have an escort from the utility there with me, so I can show the findings to the escort, and then they can uh, take that to their uh, their management and let them take appropriate action. But yeah, documentation is uh, documentation and awareness is key. I agree wholeheartedly there. Yeah, if you can't document it, then, uh, you know, if you have somebody that uh, objects to you, uh, if your customer says no, no way that happened, um, yeah, you need to be able to document that. So. Yeah. And uh, speaking of the hotel, I guess somebody is asking here, did you ever discover the source of corrosion in the basement of the hotel? Yeah, unfortunately, we, we didn't. I, I would sure like to know what it was that was causing those fasteners to corrode that, that quickly. mystery for another time yeah. <laughs> all right well Craig should we hand it over to you here yeah thank you Jonathan yeah we are so glad <laughs> to have Maurice Blackwell Travis Smith and Joe DeVito for Badger Meter with us today Maurice you have had a truly remarkable career in the water industry and it's always a pleasure to visit with you Thank you, uh, for Craig. those of you who don't know Maurice, he's uh, been with Badger Meter for over 27 years, and he is now the Senior Manager of Utility Solutions. I think Maurice started when he was about 10. Uh, I was 11. Oh, you're 11. Okay. Yeah. Many of you may recognize uh, Maurice as the host of Badger Meter's The Smart Water Show, which is a terrific online resource for information on smart water topics, technologies, and solutions. And we heartily can congratulate you on approaching the second anniversary of the Smart Water Show. And Maurice, in his spare time, is also a well-known jazz music, music critic, and he is both the president and publisher of jazzreview.com. And Joe has a very unique role in that he serves both sides of the water industry. He is a strategic solutions architect for Badger Meter, and he's also the mayor of the town of Port Royal, South Carolina. And then Travis has been with Badger Meter for a little over a year as a senior director of strategic marketing. But uh, Travis and Jonathan and I have been working together for many years on various AWWA committees. And we're certainly glad that uh, all three of you could join us today. 
And Maurice, Badger Meter certainly has grown its static water meter product line in the last year. And would you please tell us more about your new G2 residential E-series water meter and how does this new ultrasonic water meter differ from the first generation E-series residential meters? You know, sometimes, Craig, I forget that these meters have been on the market as long as they are. You know, we, we introduced our first residential size ultrasonic meter back in 2008. So think about 12 years of development here. Well, when these meters first came to market, right, their, their draw is that they've got no moving parts. And having no moving parts, I've got nowhere. I'm going to have that long-term sustainable accuracy. That's what every water utility is, is wishing for. Well, back in 2017, there was a company out of the Louisville, Sweden called Deep Low Technology. That company had helped most of the U.S. manufacturers bring their ultrasonic meters to market. Badger Meter purchased that company back in 2017 because we wanted to sort of fast track increasing some of the capabilities of the meters and increasing the sizes as well. So we have started to redesign some of our meters and our new Gen 2 series meter, one of the biggest capabilities that is adding for customers is increased revenue capture. So think about a typical residential meter. You're recording flows from maybe a quarter of a gallon, a half gallon per minute, up to about 20 or 25 gallons per minute. This new G2 residential size has an operating range measuring all the way down to eight one hundredths of a gallon, and then an extended operating range going all up to 30 gallons per minute. So typically where you may have had a three quarter inch meter in that application, you're now able to put this type of meter. And then on an extended low flow basis where your accuracy is, goes to 97%, I'm recording now at four one hundredths of a gallon. That's a lot of revenue capture. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. With very low head loss too, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have to say we are equally impressed with the new large Badger Meter G2 ultrasonic meters. And as a design engineer, I appreciate the fact that Badger Meter has released this new ultrasonic meter in both a turbine lay length and a compound lay length. I also appreciate that these meters are both UL listed and FM approved for fire service applications because that those two things make my job much easier. Right. Can you tell us a little bit more about what these meters have to offer water utilities today and what kind of battery life a customer can expect? A great question. This is where I see most water utilities sort of dipping their toe in the water, if you will, with electronic meters, or ultrasonic meters, is on their large meter applications. These meters have a 10-year battery life, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing that we've done with this design is we've designed it to have a replaceable set of electronics, right? The, the, the pipe itself, the, the meter body itself, is like a glorified piece of pipe. So what you're able to do is, after that 10-year where the battery dies, is you're able to remove the electronics and put a new series of electronics in, keeping the, the pipe, if you will, the body of the meter in place, and then just recalibrating that, and you've got a brand new meter in place. But again, these meters are coming almost more like sensors as well. You've got integrated pressure and temperature capabilities in these meters, and that data, the pressure and temperature data, is now able to be sent back over an AMI system as well. So utilities are always looking for ways to monitor different pressure zones throughout the system. Now having this capability, that meter is giving you that data. The other thing that I want to point out about these is sometimes you might have your end customer, large customer, wanting to have access to that data, like you know, consumption data, sending it to their maybe four to 20 or have a pulse or a scaled or unscaled pulse. They now are able to have a dual output capability on these meters and then send that information on to your customer. Those are great features, but the one thing that I want to get back to is what I touched on with the smaller meters. It's the increase in operating range and revenue capture. What I've highlighted here is the three inch size and now this extended operating range. With a three inch meter now, you're able to capture flows down to three quarters of a gallon all the way up to 560 gallons per minute. Because I've got no moving parts, right? My max continuous duty is the top of my operating range. And then my extended low flow at 97% goes all the way down to three eighths of a gallon. Well, let's compare that to maybe a typical three inch compound meter. 
the three inch compound meter would now have capabilities to read down to a half gallon per minute. So I'm pretty close to that operating range there. But the high side of a three inch compound meter is only up to 450 gallons per minute. So I've got a lot more on the operating range. And then because I've got moving parts in a mechanical meter, I've got a max continuous duty. That max continuous duty of a three inch would be 400 gallons per minute. So think about the added capability where I might not need to upsize to a larger meter and I can get that same capability out of a smaller meter at the three inch size. And then my extended low flow on a um, three inch compound meter would be down to uh, a quarter of a gallon per minute. So I'm very close to being able to get that low side, same type of capabilities without having a moving parts meter, meaning I'm going to have less maintenance involved here as well. Absolutely, and uh, the the six and the eight inch meters are those are those available now? Those those have been released. Those are both available to be purchased. Okay, well, let's let's talk about installation for a minute. I I know that the uh, the G two large ultrasonic water meter can be installed in either the horizontal or the vertical plane. Does does Badger meter recommend any lengths of straight pipe either upstream or downstream the the from the from the meter to stabilize the flow profile entering the meter and, and increase its accuracy. That's a, that's a good point, uh, Craig. These meters are like a turbine meter where they're a inferential meter. I'm measuring velocity. I do need to have a, a, a pretty straight velocity profile approaching the meter. We recommend five pipe diameters upstream and then five down. A little different than you would have if you had a, a traditional mechanical meter where if you didn't have a strainer in place, you'd have to have 10 pipe diners of straight pipe. So in the case where you might have a small vault or you don't have a lot of room there, this might be a, a better application there as well. Okay. What about strainers? If, if there is an existing strainer uh, in the setting, uh, should you leave the strainer where it is or should you install the strainer downstream of the meter? Interesting thing about these meters is they don't require a strainer at all. If you look at through our, our Gen 2 meters, these are completely open tube design. So I don't really need that strainer there. The one thing where I would say about a strainer, and I, I love asking this question of a water utility, do you have a strainer maintenance cleaning program? And I think I've only had one utility ever say to me, yeah, I, I actually clean our strainers every six months. The reason I say that is because when you do have a strainer in place, as I heard Jonathan say earlier, strainers are great. You need to have them there. But when you don't clean a strainer and you have this buildup of debris, you're actually skewing the water velocity profile, which could screw, skew your readings as well. So again, another case for this meter is that I don't need a strainer. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, Maurice. I've been doing this a little bit shorter than you have. I've only been doing it 20 years, and I, too, have only known of one utility that cleaned their strainers annually. So, yeah, I, I agree completely with you. Right. What are some new features with the Badger Meter Beacon AMA system and its analytics software suite and, of course, your Eye on Water customer engagement portal? Well, I, I, there's a lot of features I'm going to touch on, just a couple of two exciting features that are coming. When it comes to AMI today, we're delivering a lot of data, right? 15-minute interval data. And as I always say to utilities, well, you know, what are you going to do with that data if you don't have a powerful analytics package behind you? One of the new features we're adding is what we call data watchers. And what the data watchers allows the utility to do is to say, you know, what type of exception, anomalous conception, exception conditions do I care about? Leaks or tampers, reverse flow, high flow, low flow, no flow. Instead of having someone come in and do some special programming or reporting on those, we've set up a system where the data watcher allows you to pick the type of anomaly that you want to hear about, select the accounts that you want to monitor, and then say, how do you want to be notified? And then the system will then notify you when you have those exception conditions. So it makes the system a heck of a lot more powerful. The one other point that I'll make on our Ion Water Consumer Portal, we've also added the capability now to do bill presentment and bill pay in those portals as well. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, well, Travis, in your role as Senior Director of Strategic Marketing for Badger Meter, 
Can you discuss the, the future of, of smart water from your point of view? Sure, Craig. Thanks for having us today on the Blue Water webinar series. Uh, you know, what I think today people are really buying is an automatic data collection and analytics, as the value is really in the information and being presented to the utilities for a multitude of purposes. And, and so those systems comprise of intelligent measurement. Maurice talked about a lot of the, the features in the new water meters, and, and we're expanding that beyond just metrology into other sensors and adding sensors into the meter. So that measurement capability is expanding. And then you have to bring the information to the utility's front door through communications. And it's not just a singular basis, but you see hybrids and multitudes of, of conveyance methods to bring that information and then integrating it with data that the utility may already have or metadata from the rest of the world. And then finally putting that into a package where you can get Intel out of it to be used beyond just meter to cash applications that have been the historical basis of these types of systems. But now we see it being applied to health and safety, asset management, operations, engineering planning, customer service, as well as the classic meter to cash. And that helps open up a multitude of benefits of revenue capture, cost reduction, risk mitigations in the utilities. You guys talked earlier today about a lot of of bad potential scenarios by identifying with better data, you can abate those risks. Enhancing customer service, increasing the efficiency to increase the, the sustainability of the utility, as well as improve those asset optimizations through the life cycle of the utility. Well, you, you mentioned automated data collection and analytics. Is, is this the future of AMI? Yeah, I think that the term AMI is now becoming somewhat antiquated because advanced meter infrastructure is no longer really applicable to what's being taken place. So you see a multitude of measurement. And, and today you see utilization of cellular communications. So there's already 400,000 cellular towers in the United States alone that can be deployed as an asset uh, for those utilities to collect data so it, it's no longer just a function of meters and infrastructure, as that term indicates, but really a collection of measurement, communications, data, and analytics as a holistic package for the utilities to use for a multitude of benefits. So how, how do you see water utilities taking all of this data that is now available through uh, an AMI network and, and using it? Uh, for distribution system operation and, and optimization? Sure. Well, there's obviously the, the classic meter to cash applications that we've talked about here throughout the webinar. But now we can utilize data throughout the distribution system and even source water, uh, plant operations, collection systems. The most common and easiest and probably the, the next foray into the industry is monitoring pressure because that can give you an indication both of, of inflow, water main bursts, or potential service risks associated with that particular delivery of the water. And it also provides an indicator of leakage and efficiency in the system that can be used to identify non-revenue water places to, to repair leaks or potential um, tamper conditions or service, con service connections that were unauthorized. So some exciting times for the water industry to come as we combine those types of data of flow, hydraulics, and water quality for a multitude of uses. Yeah, we, it's, a, it's a great time to be in our industry. And, and thank you, Travis. And now I'd like to uh, talk to Joe. Uh, Joe, over the past two years, Badger Meter has made two very significant acquisitions to move into the water quality space. And can you tell us more about these? Yeah, Craig, thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much for asking me about that. And you're correct. Over the past two years, we purchased both SCAN and ATI. And if you look at these two companies, there's 50 years worth of experience between these companies. So these are not new startup companies in any way. They're well known in the industry and across the world in that aspect. And the reason these companies make sense for Badger, well, first of all, it meets the model of low maintenance. These are reagent free sensors, no chemical contracts associated with the standard monitoring that is required. We're using both optical and electrical chemical sensors 
to be able to read water quality and bring it to your desktop the same way we brought meter readings to your desktop. We can bring these type of water quality devices in again. And also these two companies were both already in the cellular space, which fit very well with what we believe is the future for, as Travis would say, an AMI network that's probably going to change its terminology in time. So the next slide that comes up here is really allows us to think about where Badger Meter is with the acquisition of these two customers, our metrology line of where we are in the water cycle. And we're in all aspects of the water cycle from the raw water, from the source water supply, to the production, the delivery, the, the final uh, water consumption side, the distribution network, back through the wastewater and right back into that water stream. So through our water quality and our metrology side, we're able to help utilities, municipalities, counties really know exactly what's happening and be a good steward of the environment all the way through this water cycle. So the slide that I have here is talking about the different parameters that you can monitor in the system. So if you think about water quality and you're thinking about that entire water cycle, there are over 400 different parameters that can be monitored. We're at about 35 of those, but if you think about the distribution system and what the EPA recommends, what we're really looking at is chlorine, pH, conductivity, turbidity, ORP, which measures that cleanliness of the water, nitrites, organics. Wow, we can take organics from the lab and do it out in the distribution system with our optical sensors and move that away from a laboratory response right out into the distribution system and report that information in and back to the desktop. With our pressure and temperature, we already entered into that market with our E-series meters. So com combining the E-series meters with these, with these type of sensors really allows you to manage the entire distribution network. What you're looking at here is one of the assets that you could use to deploy. So this is what we call our Metronet system, which is a low powered system. It runs approximately two years off of D cell batteries. The maintenance that required is really a six month maintenance activity to go by clean the chlorine sensor and allow you to keep that to use it as a reportable way to report what's happening in the system. So if anybody is doing daily grab samples and bringing them back to the lab and running those, we now have solutions and monitoring stations to bring them directly out in the field. Go ahead and bring that information in, bring it through the cellular network, and we can supply that information through dual output, just like our meter. So the distribution guys maybe look at that through Beacon, but if the laboratory side needs that for their other information, it can go to, into a SCADA system or into your LIMS system as well. The next device that I've got listed here is what we call our pipe scan. I'm really proud of this device and very excited about this because this device, it's not a low power device, but it has no waste stream whatsoever. So this device gets mounted directly onto a piece of pipe. It uses our, our optical sensors. It can measure up to 10 different parameters and it, it uses a nano pump to draw the water into the device, circulate it through the sensors and inject it right back into that pipe. So you, you don't have to worry about a waste stream for freezing. There's no chemicals involved and allows you to really look at that. The analytics behind this, it monitors constantly what it's sampling and it will notice anomalies and report them to you immediately if a sample starts getting out of the normal parameters. Not something that you have to set up, it looks for it and it notifies you of that in that aspect. Wow, that's, that, that is truly amazing. And uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing that information with us. Uh, we're going to invite you. We don't have much time left, but we do invite you to uh, please uh, have, ask any questions uh, through the Q&A module. I, I have one mus uh, myself, Joe, and that is, uh, are the various state environmental agencies accepting data from, uh, uh, from the re remote scan for the reporting purposes? Yes, but the chlorine sensors, which is the most common one we get asked about, is a lot can be used for reporting methods. The EPA actually recommends some of our devices. They don't ever support or say use this device, but they ha our devices have been recognized by the EPA for distribution monitoring. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you, Joe. And if you have any more questions, uh, please uh, reach out to us at uh, blue, bluewater at jci.com. And Jonathan, would you uh, bring us home? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Craig. And um, thank you, everyone, again, for being here with us this morning uh, to the part two of our conclusion for the large meters. So um, next uh, month on May 18th, specifically, we'll be talking about uh, fundamentals of distribution leak system leak detections. So we'll be talking about, um, you know, finding those leaks out in your distribution system. I'll, I know a lot of folks, they think uh, leak detection, they think about the meters and, and letting customers know uh, that they have a leak on their side of the meter. And there's there's uh, a lot more to that story. So we'll, we'll dive into that next month. And uh, our industry partner will be ITRON. And they'll talk to us a little bit about uh, some of what they can do in, in the space here. Uh, the, the link, as you can see, there is on the slide. Unfortunately, it's not not live, but um, you know it's there. Or uh, you know, you can look for a communication from us uh, as the webinar gets closer. I did want to say a very special thank you again to our our guests this morning, uh, Aaron, uh, Maurice, Travis, and Joe. Appreciate. Uh, all of you being here with us this morning and sharing your expertise and things that you've seen uh, through your many years of experience in the industry. And we definitely appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here with us this morning and, and share all that with us. So uh, with that, we'll, with that, we'll, you know, so with that, we'll conclude um, again, if you have any questions either for us or, or anybody else, um, you know, please don't hesitate to contact contact us at bluewater at jci.com. That is our email address. Um, if you use that uh, email uh, box feature on your console, that's that's where that email will go as well. And uh, again, if you heard something that you just want to talk more about, maybe sometimes you know, sometimes it's just better to pick up the phone. Um, you know, please book a meeting with us. We're happy to uh, field your questions and, and talk to you a little bit more there as well. So, thank you again for joining us this morning, and we will see you next month. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.